Hello everyone, I'm Alan Wong, Public Information Officer for Contra Costa County and welcome to a roundtable discussion with candidates for Contra Costa County Supervisor District 4. County District 4 covers several cities in central, in central Contra Costa, including parts of Pleasant Hill, Concord, Walnut Creek, and Clayton. It also covers Morgan Territory, Mount Diablo, and the surrounding foothills. Today's forum is sponsored by the Contra Costa County Elections Division, Contra Costa Television, and the West County and Diablo Valley League of Women Voters. We are recording these roundtable discussions here in the studios of Contra Costa County Television with assistance from the cities of Concord, Richmond, and Walnut Creek. The candidates are Ken Carlson and Deborah Allen. We drew lots before the show to determine the speaking order, so we're going to begin with Ken Carlson. Thank you, Alan. First off, let me just say thank you to the League of Women Voters, Contra Costa County TV, and, and everyone who made this possible. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to be here. A little bit about me, I am a lifelong Contra Costa resident. I uh, grew up in Concord and Pleasant Hill, and I served the Concord community for 29 years as a police officer in a variety of assignments. And then later chose to serve the residents of Pleasant Hill, where I also grew up, uh, as a city council member. I've been serving on the Pleasant Hill City Council now for 10 years. A lot of accomplishments, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, there's things about housing, homelessness, our environment, and our economy that need to be addressed. And that's why I'm seeking the office of the Board of Supervisors for District 4. Deborah Allen. Hi, thank you to the League and to the CCTV staff. Uh, I'm Deborah Allen. I spent a 35-year career in the private sector as a, in, in financial management roles such as CPA, CFO. Uh, owned my own uh, business a couple of times and uh, still currently am a, a business owner. In addition to that, I spent 10 years in public service, uh, beginning first with an appointment to the Contra Costa County Pension Board and followed by election twice to the BART Board of Directors. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm running because I think we have a lot of problems to solve, particularly after the last two and a half years that we've been through. Uh, our working families are suffering, our children are suffering, and I'm a problem solver. I've done that my whole career. And I think we have a lot of really great challenges here in the county that I believe a finance career person can bring a lot to the table for. Yeah, speaking of finances, it is difficult to buy a home in the Bay Area. It is difficult to pay rent. People are struggling. Deborah, how should the county be addressing our housing crisis? The housing crisis. Um, we didn't get here overnight. It's been uh, really since 2007 when we faced the Great Recession and builders stopped building here. Uh, and so as, as we continued to build our population here and no additional housing was provided, it's really simply a supply and demand issue. Uh, I think a lot has happened in the last few years to get us back rolling, um, but really it's hard for developers here. And part of that is our own internal uh, processes within cities and with counties in getting projects approved. Uh, lots of regulation, lots of bureaucracy, and it takes a very long time for these developers to get, get things going here. And so when they have a choice of building somewhere else, and they can do it a lot faster and easier in other places, they're going to do that instead of here. Ken, how do we deal with this housing crisis? Well, it really starts with inventory. We do have to build. We have to entice the developers to come to our communities and to build. But you know, uh, on the Pleasant Hill City Council, we uh, and, and I myself have strived for the variety of housing that we need across all income levels. There are opportunities for us out there that many of our communities in the county hasn't taken advantage of. Building workforce housing or turning housing into workforce housing opportunities are there uh, through tax exempt bonds, through CDA, uh, CSCDA. So in Pleasant Hill alone, we've done two projects where we have converted over 500 apartment units to workforce housing. And what that means is, and many of those residents already qualify. Nobody's displaced, but ultimately if you qualify, you meet that 80 to 120% AMI income wise, you're gonna see a rent decrease of anywhere from $100 a month to $700 a month. And this is gonna support 
those that are working in our communities, our teachers, our nurses, our medical providers, those types of people that are having to commute long distances. So we need to tap into more of those opportunities. There are nonprofit developers out there. Again, I share the example of Pleasant Hill because we've aggressively done this. We partnered with Saha to build 80 units of low-income senior housing near a care facility. So they have the services they need right in their front yard. We've worked with Habitat with uh, Free Humanity to build seven units. So we just need to really aggressively pursue the housing opportunities. We work hard to uh, bring our developers. We work hard to, to streamline the process as much as possible. We support our ADU programs. So there are a variety of opportunities. We need to carry those forwards and we need to aggressively pursue them. And then you have a whole sector, of a growing sector of people who are just flat out homeless. Ken, how should the county be dealing with this growing group of homeless folks? We've, we've started, as a county, we've started the process. A3, uh, you know, anytime, anywhere, anywhere um, any person. But doing more with our mental health outreach, increasing our mental health support services, partnering with our nonprofit partners is huge because they're gonna fill the gap until we as a county can actually increase and expand those services. We need to address those mental health issues, those um, substance abuse issues. We need to build uh, emergency shelters. We need to have places for them to go. When our core team goes out and tries to communicate with our homeless population, we really don't have a place to place them. And then we need to move into building supportive and transitional housing. Supportive housing where those in need get the services on site that they really truly need as opposed to having to shotgun across the county to get mental health support or medical support or other social services that we can provide. Deborah, how should the county be dealing with this homeless situation? Well, I think Ken makes really good points. Uh, the look at the end of the day, much of our homeless, what we call the homeless problem, really is caused by other underlying problems. It is caught when we peel back that layer of why is a person so unstable that they are not, they do not even have a home to live in. What we really often find is that it is mental health services. Uh, addiction services, and really, um, you know, particularly with children, uh, there are many adults out there with children who are living hold homeless. We, as a county, have not kept up with the demand for the services that are needed in those areas. And so, really, you, I, I don't know that we, uh, we can certainly work all those areas together, uh, building transitional shelters, that is certainly needed, because really, at the end of the day, leaving them there on the street is the most inhumane thing that we can do for anyone who is unhoused. Uh, but, but we've got to focus on expansion of this county in how they provide those mental health services. Uh, but, you know, we can talk about all the expansion of all the things that we need to do, but at the end of the day, we also have a county that is full of departments and systems that are broken unto themselves. They don't operate efficiently, they don't operate effectively, and that is why they're struggling to deliver the services that are needed to some extent. We know that in other counties, I have the benefit of sitting on a five regional, uh, a five county regional board. And so I know, I hear what other counties do in the Bay Area. And even our own law enforcement officers who work in the multiple counties will say that the, the services available in this county are far less than what uh, is available in other counties, but also the process the process of getting people into those services is very difficult in this county. I've talked to people involved in that process, and they tell me that it's, you know, there are these very small windows of opportunity to get an unhoused person off of the street and into services. And when you don't have enough of them, or there's so much paperwork and bureaucracy involved in getting that person in the door for services, oftentimes we lose them, they're back out on the street. So I think I, my focus is going to be a lot of attention on what is our process internally for this county of delivery of many of these services, whether it's housing or, or homeless or, or behavioral health, um, you can go through the list. Okay, if you, but if you want to expand those services, you need money. Yes. You need to pay those social workers. One of the big complaints is there's not parity 
uh, with other counties. So Contra Costa County, in terms of just social services, we train them and then they leave mm -hmm. to go to San Francisco and Alameda County. Are you in favor of creating parity and, and a more competitive pay scale for to attract and build more of those social services? Yes, we definitely need to build a, 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 a whole pipeline of behavioral health service providers. Okay, but that is again going to be a, a long process of educating people because these people require a lot of special edu uh, specialized education. So investments in those education programs, investments in how much we pay people. Um, but look, it's, it's just uh, sort of like police officers. There aren't enough of them in the entire area. There aren't enough behavioral health specialists either. Um, and so what we need to do is be looking at the programs, the money we're spending, and we are spending a lot of money in this county, we need to be looking at the money we're spending and how we're spending it, and is, are we spending that money on the most effective programs, or are some of them a lot more effective than others, and do we need to be taking a hard look at how we allocate the money to the programs? You talk about the lack of police officers, deputies in the county. Ken, you were a police officer. It's not exactly <clears throat> a job that very many people want nowadays. Uh, recruitment and retainment of these officers is difficult. Uh, is it a money issue? What's the solution? Uh, it, it's not really a money issue. Mm -hmm. um, it really is a cultural issue. It, it, we need to rebuild some of the, the, the walls that were torn down um, in the sense of how do we work together? Um, how do we open these doors? You know, it, there's, we're very fortunate in Pleasant Hill. I'll, I'll use that as the example because that's my hands on in the sense of hiring and retention. Yeah. We faced those challenges 10 years ago. And we, it was because we were not parity. We were not uh, working on how we're gonna retain these people through their pay. We've done that. We're now fully staffed. We're very fortunate to be fully staffed because you look across this county and they're facing significant shortages and unable to retain uh, and, and or hire. And, and it really isn't about the money. Um, again, what is it about? It, it, it is about the culture. We need to get our officers out in the community. We need to rebuild the trust that the last two to three years has been shaken. And that's weeding out the bad apples. Um, that is an open dialogue. In Pleasant Hill, our chief has created the Citizens Advisory Board. He brings them in. He talks about the policy. He in, in, engages the public with our officers, with policy, with oversight. Everything we're doing, we're sharing with the public. And we need to do more of that. There's so much to be done. When we talk about um, the programming that we do, one of the, one of the initiatives uh, that I was a part of at the Concord Police Department was what we called the Forensic Mental Health Team. And this is much like what now has evolved into what the governor signed yesterday, the CARES Court. So we would collaborate and work as a team with our probation department, with our courts, with the police, um, with behavioral health specialists, with housing specialists. And then those that we knew were chronic offenders suffering from mental health and or addiction issues, we would get control in the sense of, just like the CARES Court, their probation terms would be such that we could get them into mental health programming, get them into substance abuse program. We need to follow those models. There is so much work to be done. I have a, you know, on the last 10 years alone on just the city council, serving on the John Muir Community Health Fund, seeing what's going on with some of our marginalized populations with access to housing, health care, food, all of these bridges that we need to do. So you think that increasing or bolstering the support for police officers will make the job more attractive to, re to increase recruitment? Well, I, I think it's building the public trust, yes, because there's that fear of I'm, I'm not wanted, I'm not thought of as being needed, uh, I'm going to be attacked, those types of things. They provide a service that we all want, and, and yet there's that fear of what are the consequences if I do that job? Deborah, uh, how do you increase recruitment and retainment in the police departments? Well, it, 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 just like mental health professionals, it, it's a challenge, okay? When I began at BART, by the way, I, I'm, I sit on a board that manages uh, a police department with over 300 people, uh, some 183 police officers. 
Uh, and the rest of them, uh, there actually is a pretty large force of unsworn civilian help to the police officers. Um, we've been doing this at BART for uh, actually before people in cities were talking about this. Um, but here's the thing, uh, when I got to BART in 2017, we had 47 vacant positions out of 189 police officers. And um, morale was low. And when you have that many vacant positions, you, you, you cannot, officers cannot cover one another. They feel like they cannot keep each other safe. Um, but at, as, at the same time, we were not providing the training needed to police officers to properly deal with the people in crisis that they encounter on the streets. Yet, those officers, those senior officers, have been dealing with people in crisis on the streets their whole career. And I'm sure Ken, you know, is shaking his head. Yes, he did that too, okay? They know, uh, they, they learned it on the job. But what we should be transitioning to is a place where training is, is given to our younger officers. And they're learning through training, but they're also given support services from other people. We have all these support services at BART. We have crisis intervention teams. We have uh, community service officers, uh, all, and three others, ambassadors and others. Okay, all unsworn officers, but at the end of the day, the people in crisis who are attracted to our uh, transit system, we can help them all we, all we can, we can provide them with the information, but if they don't want the services, we have to take new steps. And in addition to that, when we do encounter people who are willing to take services, our officers find over and over and over again that all of the counties do not have enough services. There are not enough beds and shelters. There are not enough places for them to go. So really, we should be focusing on those county services for our unhoused people and our people in crisis first. And I think that will take a lot of the pressure off of our policing when we have the place for them to go instead of them just ending back you know, in whatever city or transit system they came from, which you is almost, often the case. You almost have to be a psychotherapist to be an officer nowadays. You do. But Ken, do you agree? You have the, the training hadn't been there in the past. I mean, you, you were an officer 20 years ago. And uh, do they need more of that? Clearly they do, but we need to realign our police services. And, and, and you'll talk to some police chiefs who say, no, my officers get all the crisis intervention training they could ever need, or they're, they're trained mental health professionals in the sense of what they're gonna have to deal with. I would, I would take argument with that, and what I think we really need to do, and I'll, I'll just share some experience. I mean, if you're in a mental health crisis, is the officer in a uniform wearing a duty belt with a gun and a badge the calming influence that you want in the middle of a mental health crisis? And clearly, it's proven it's not. It doesn't mean we can't manage them, but we're not trained healthcare professionals. And we need to take that off our officer's plate. It, we need to take social service work, some of the social service calls they're going to. So if we realign our services, take mental health off their plate, unless there's criminal activity or violence involved, take some of the social service calls off their plate. They can go out and be police officers. They can go out and proactively deter crime, uh, look for you know those crimes of opportunity as well as investigate the crimes that we want them to do let's take some of those things off their plate I, I you know and I'm as guilty as any elected official you know we sit at the dais and we we want to ban flavored tobacco which we did in Pleasant Hill we want to ban outdoor smoking we did in Pleasant Hill but who's responsible for enforcing those things so we just keep stacking the workload on them that they're not able to do it all and so we need to start thinking about how can we realign those services, pull them back. I think mental health is critical. We have those, we have 988 now, um, 211 is a big help, the A3 program is a big help. We need to do more, when, especially in the mental health field and the homelessness field. I will tell you from personal experience, um, I'm, I'm somewhat unique in the work I've done, um, but I would provide certain clients, and I'll call them clients because they suffered from mental health issues, not criminal behavior, my personal cell phone. If I'm on duty and you're reaching a point where you think you're gonna go into crisis, look, call me and I'll help you before it gets to where the police have to truly get involved. But when I thought about that and went back and looked in our records, this individual was 5150, sent to county psych emergency services anywhere from 150 to 170 times a year. 
5150 meeting, they have psychological issues. Psychological issues. They are in crisis. They are going to be held for a period of up to 72 hours okay. in, in a psych facility. But that many times in a year, once every other day essentially, something is broken in the system. So, and we do. We need to create and, and find opportunities for more healthcare, behavioral healthcare professionals. Um, we see this throughout the county. Part of the work I do on the John Muir Community Health Fund is funding these initiatives. And quite often it's a behavioral health person to fill a gap at a nonprofit organization. They can't hire. Try to find a bilingual mm. behavioral health specialist or mental health specialist. Challenging. So we also now need to think about how do we create those career pathways? How do we create those opportunities for them to get into the workforce? Working with the community colleges, the universities. Yes, yes. Okay, of course, all of this costs money. Deborah, what, what in your opinion is the top budget priority with all of these needs? Uh, well, top budget priority, I believe, um, has to be first and foremost, the safety of our public, right? But all of these, uh, behavioral health issues do start to creep in to that public safety conversation. And, um, you know, I think recently the county has uh, increased the budget. Measure X money was spent on additional uh, behavioral health um, uh, initiatives. Uh, some money was spent on increasing some officers in the sheriff's department. I know I live in sort of a far away uh, land in this county and uh, you know, we have a really long lead time in response from the Contra Costa Sheriff's Department. Um, so, you know, I mean, what, what are the num to me, the number one budget initiative for me when, you know, when I'm, w should I be elected to the County Board of Supervisors? It's going to be first looking within. It is gonna be looking within our county departments and saying, how can we free up spending? Uh, how can we identify efficiencies within those departments to free up money for the future, okay? And because that is how we will be able to deliver more services. We, we just went out, the county just went out to the public for more money in Measure X. Taxpayers stepped up and said, here you go. But guess what? I, I'm gonna guess that in another two years, it's already gonna be allocated and they're gonna say, but we don't have enough money for that, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the way it, it goes. And so we are so far behind in this county on technology uh, and we have a workforce crisis right now where uh, we do not have enough workers for any of the jobs anywhere, whether private sector, government, I know, uh, you know, at BART, we've got all kinds of unfilled positions and I hear they do, they have some of that at the county as well, right? Mm -hmm. so, so freeing up through technology, streaming, streamlining our systems and our processes in this county is, could come at a really opportune time for us to start to reduce the number of positions and free up the money. Save money to yeah. pay for it. Ken, real quick, uh, we got about a minute left. Uh, your budget priority, where does this county need to put its money? Well, I, I think we do. We look for those duplicities where there's overlap, there's inefficiencies. So, and again, it's going to be focused in on how these systems overlap, behavioral health, our healthcare system. How can we streamline those and, and filter out the waste? Because we can do it much better, we can do it much more efficiently, and we can save a lot of dollars. But I also want to invest in this county in the sense of economic development. We've missed opportunities to bring business opportunities to this county and we really need to go there and bring tech or biotech those types of opportunities to our county where we workers are here okay thank you ken and i want to thank all, all of our candidates for answering these questions each candidate will now have two minutes to make a closing statement and we're going to start with deborah allen well thank you to the league of women voters and cctv for having us here today this is really important for us to um, for us to be able to present to the public uh, where we stand as candidates and information. I believe elected leaders should be held to making policy decisions that first and foremost improve the quality of life of the people they serve. We need leaders with personal integrity, independence, and creative problem solving ability to unite and strengthen our community. 
My record as an outspoken, politically independent, guardian of public money speaks for itself. In my decade of public service, I have consistently promoted transparency and accountability to not only the taxpayers, but to also the people who we serve. I believe experience matters. I am the only candidate who serves on a five county regional board with a $2.4 billion annual budget and over 4,000 workers in a very diverse workforce. In my five years on the BART Board of Directors, I fought against special interests, and, to, and, and I did that to end wasteful spending. Things like an inspector general, like audit committees. Uh, we are in the process of embarking on a new project to replace fair gates at BART and to um, reorganize the entire finance structure at the BART Board of Directors. As a working mother, I understand the importance of a strong education system, and I know what parents are going through and what they've been through for the last two and a half years, um, trying to work their way, w keep their jobs, and, and keep their children safe and educated as well. Contra Costa needs a strong advocate who can represent interests of all people across the regional Bay Area. My passion is good government that works for everyone and I'll bring that to the Contra Costa Board. I hope I can count on your support and your vote. Thank you. Ken Carlson. Thank you, Alan, and thank you again to the League of Women Voters and CCTV for making this forum possible. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Again, as a lifelong Contra Costa resident who has devoted the majority of my life to serving this community, the public, uh, 29 years as a police officer serving in a variety of assignments, most notably, again, as a crisis negotiator and working on the mental health forensics team. And then 10 years serving on the Pleasant Hill City Council where we've made significant achievements and successes, uh, starting with fiscal sustainability, fiscal responsibility. When I came to the City Council, we had no long-term financial plan. We now plan 10 years in advance. We have a long term financial plan. We have now built our reserves to over $11 million. For a city of Pleasant Hill, $31 million annual budget, having that significant of a reserve to fall back on is, is huge. I have served on countywide boards and commissions, the Airport Land Use Commission, the Hazardous Materials Commission, the boards of our Family Justice Center. Um, I've just continued to do all these works, building partnerships across the county with our nonprofit partners and other uh, elected leaders. I'm supported and endorsed by State Treasurer Fiona Ma, Congressman Malk Desalonye, Senator Dodd, Assemblymember Grayson, and numerous local elected leaders across the district, let alone the county and the region. I have served and worked diligently with the League of California Cities over the last 10 years which is all 482 cities in the state of California working collaboratively together to address the issues most impactful to us. And that's exactly what I will take to the Board of Supervisors when I'm elected on November 8th. I'm grateful for your support. To find out more information, go to kencarlson.vote. Email me directly at ken at kencarlson.vote. Thank you. All right, you just heard it from our candidates running for District 4 of the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors. Once again, our candidates are Ken Carlson and Deborah Allen. For more information on the candidates, ballot measures, and who supports them, go to votersedge.org. The last day to register is October 24th. All eligible registered Contra Costa voters will receive a vote by mail ballot for the November 8th general election. You can find detailed information on the upcoming election on the Contra Costa County Elections website, cocovote.us. I'm Alan Wong, Public Information Officer for Contra Costa County. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to vote on November the 8th.